But today I'm really, really excited because I get to speak to Beth and Lily. Um, and Beth and Lily are very important girls to one of my greatest friend that um, I spoke to already on this podcast, and that's Mark Spencer. And they are an important part of her life. And so I hear about Beth and Lily all the time, but this is my first time that I actually get to have a conversation just with them. And uh, that makes me very excited. And I'm also very excited because I think that's a great um, gift that they're giving us today by talking to us about their life and their family and, um, and what they like and what's important to them. So Beth and Lily, welcome. Uh, we are very, I am very excited to have you here and to have this time to be able to chat with you guys. Thank you for having us. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to start and it's going to be easy. I'm just going to ask you, who is your family and how would you describe your family? Um, well, obviously I'm Elizabeth and Lily is my twin. Uh, we also then have our mum. Uh, our three aunties that we're very close to um, and their kids which I think we have eight cousins um, and then we have Shelly and Nikki who are who looked after our mum when she was younger and her children their, their children um, and then we have Margaret and all the Spencers and all that um, we also have Susan Collins, um, then we have Marianne and, well, we have two Mariannes and then, uh, one of them has a partner called Normie, um, and then okay. our friends. <laughs> it's very, like, supportive kind of group. Yeah. yeah. Well. What's amazing to me is that, I mean, I know a bit about your life, obviously, through Margaret, um, but I, I had not realized how many people is sort of in your circle. And, you know, yeah, people from your work. mom's world, from Margaret's world. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit, you know, about who Marg is to you and, and which part you know, does she play and which part each of them sort of play? Maybe not like each of them, but sort of like in general, how, what do they do for you or how do they help or what's their role in your lives? Um, well, Margaret, she's, she's kind of like, I guess our grandmother in a way. Um, she, we, we like go to her when we can't like have help from our mum because she doesn't understand like our schoolwork. Yeah. So we always go to her if we need help with any schoolwork that we know our mum can't quite help handle. Us with. Um, yeah. Um, well, Susan, she's, we actually grew up with some of, uh, her boys a little bit when we were younger um yeah That's so each much. person sort of has like their their role in a way um in yeah. their lives right and yeah. I guess whenever you need sort of help or or just have fun each of them sort of have have that role yeah yeah that's pretty uh so that's pretty special because you know um yeah, it's sort of like a big sort of village all around you guys and and you you get yeah. to have sort of the best of both worlds, sort of your life with your mom and then with everybody else. Yeah. <clears throat> Can you tell me um, what would be the thing that you love the most about your mom? Um, well, she always asks us if we need anything before she leaves um, when she goes out. Um, she always asks how school was when she's home and always continues to check up on us. Yeah, yeah that's pretty awesome. Um, it's interesting that you're saying that because you're both 18, so you're both now sort of adults, which is yeah. like, um, 
a big thing. And, and as you know, I have a son and my son is about to turn 12. And he's at that age where all of the things that you just mentioned is like horrible. Like he can't, you know, sort of fathom, oh my God, you're asking me again. And so it's funny that, uh, I don't know if you had that, that phase with your mom at some point where it was like, oh. <laughs> but it gives me um, hope. It gives me hope because I'm like, okay, well, maybe in six years it's going to come back. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's great. Are there things that are difficult with your mom? Um, I think certain things we try to explain to her. And if we can't explain it, like, again, or properly, um, we just simplify, simplify it as much as we can. And if she doesn't understand it, then we'll get someone else to explain to her. Yeah. 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 That's a great way of doing that. And I guess that's how, you know, you'll, you'll get sort of other people from your network that you mentioned sort of yeah. to help you out in that, uh, in that respect. And I have yeah. to say, I mean, for sure, you know, in terms of, of your mom, um, who is a lovely lady who may need, you know, some extra help in understanding certain things. Um, but I would say that with anybody in terms of like kids and parents, you know, like Thomas sometimes goes to my mom and sort of says like, oh, can you like come down and help out with that? So I don't think it has anything to do, you know, or it's not as specific as someone might think in terms of like, this is the intellectual disabilities or their learning difficulties that create that. Yeah. I think sometimes we all need sort of uh, a little sort of distance from, or, or someone else to sort of help out to understand what's going yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so lately I've seen you guys being more vocal um, in sharing about your family. And the last one that I saw, which is going to be in the show notes, because I think it's a, a very beautiful segment that you did, I believe, for ABC. Um, anyway, for I, news. Well, I think our mom took the ABC radio and then yeah. we did the project. Oh, the project. That's the one. Yeah. Exactly. Which I thought was like a beautiful segment. And it was really like the first time, I think, where I really heard your voice through throughout because often like we've heard Marg we've heard um, Amanda your mom's voice but it was really the first time where I really clearly heard um, your voice do you want to tell us a little bit about that experience uh, sharing um, for for the project well it obviously was quite scary um, but we just took our time to like say everything um, it was a new experience for sure. Yeah, because we're used to more about like being behind the camera instead of in front of it. So yeah, but it was a great experience. Yeah. yeah. What was scary for you guys, you think? Just being, I think, vulnerable, like telling people a bit about our lives and what we do sometimes. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty scary. I have to say, <laughs> I don't think you need to add anything to that because it's true. I mean, and then it's sort of like putting out there to everybody because it's sort of like on yeah. TV. So a lot of people and you never know, um, who could see it. Um, now in, in that show, actually, um, and I'm going to put Lily a little bit on the spot. You got emotional for, for a little bit. Oh, was it Beth? Oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so it was Beth. So I'm putting Beth on the spot then. Um, yeah. So Beth, you got a little emotional. Do you want to tell us about, a bit about like why or how that, that got sort of out? Um, so we were always like close with our like three cousins, Haley, Liana, and Emily, when we were younger. Um, so like when we started growing up, we kind of saw them quite often. Um, and then, um, yeah, we, as the older cousins, we kind of watched what they went through 
and all that. Um, and when they went into foster care, we knew we wouldn't be able to see them as much as we'd like to, um, which was kind of upsetting and kind of just like relived that a little bit in the uh, project. We were never asked if we wanted to see them, like how often we wanted to see them when they were first taken away and stuff like that. So got a bit emotional about that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that brings you know, I know it's hard to talk about that or, you know, just like you said, it's like putting yourself out there and making yourself very vulnerable. Um, but I think it's also very powerful, certainly for someone like me or for anybody else who works in the system or works, you know, um, helping out kids and families who may need help to hear that. And that sometimes, you know, um, Kids are being removed from, from their family of origin for different reasons. Um, but it's their whole network that gets sort of affected by that. It's not just those kids. And those kids get affected by being away from their whole network. And just like you said, you know, like for you guys, it's like nobody asked you, do you want to stay in contact with your cousins? And how yeah. often do you want to see them? And they probably weren't asked either in terms of how often do you want to see your cousins, Beth and Lily and, and, and all of that. Yeah. So I think that that's very important, I think, for anyone to, to understand that, that fear of being removed or having family sort of taken away from you. Because, um, I mean, just like you mentioned, you have, you know, such a huge sort of family or network around you guys if you had been taken away at any point, it was sort of like all of them being affected and all of you being away from, from them as well. Was there any moment, and I, I mean, you're a kid, so maybe you didn't see, but was there any moment where that might've been an option for you guys where, you know, um, because of your mom's sort of learning difficulties that you might be removed from her care? Um, yeah, there was a moment in time, yeah, where we were like home a lot on our own. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we didn't find any, like, we didn't find it hard because in a way I think that experience helped us grow our independence. Yeah. 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 Well, that too is sort of like very powerful, actually, because often, you know, we say, oh, kids, you know, we need to protect them and we need to be there for them, which is true. Um, but I remember sort of people sort of reacting when, as you know, I have, you know, uh, I had an accident. And so I raised my son now from a wheelchair. And when he was little, Uh, he learned to make his own breakfast very early, you know, at a time where other kids his age, like were very far away from, from making any breakfast on their own. And for him, it was sort of easy because one, it was like everything was available to him at his level because it needed to be available at my level. So everything went down, you know, the bowls and stuff. Um, and, you know, someone could have said, well, hold on a second, you know, you, as a parent, you're supposed to make breakfast. Um, and so it's interesting because for him, it was sort of like fun because he was like, you know, I'll do it. And sometimes he'll say, I'll prepare breakfast from you, mama, you know, but it was sort of like his way of sort of being nice to me. Uh, it wasn't a very elaborate breakfast. I mean, it was a bowl of Cheerios. Um, but it was sort of like the thought. And for him, it was like, he was proud of being able to say that. And so What I find, you know, in your answer, it's that, well, hold on a second, you know, yes, maybe you could see this as, oh, no, there's lack of supervision. But you could also yeah. see that as, well, they're actually learning something um, on their own, and they're learning to be independent, while still yeah. being safe, because I'm pretty sure that all the people around you guys would not have let anything happen to you. So if you were unsafe, somebody would have said something, right? Yeah. So um, 
So thank you for that, because that I think gives us a, a, a great alternative perspective on things. Yeah. Now, on a lighter note, because um, we talked about a bit what's emotional, <laughs> On a lighter note, you participated in Susan Collins' um, research. Now, first, do you remember anything about that research? Um, not necessarily. Like the only thing I, like we both remember is um, getting asked questions and um, get give, um, got given um, like a camera to take um, photos of whatever. Yeah. That was all we really remember. Yeah. And do you remember what you took in pictures? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's funny too, because sometimes it's true. Eight. Eh? How old were you when you did that with Susan? Ooh. Like six or seven. It maybe only really just started school. school so yeah. it was like five, six. five, six. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe slightly older than that, but yeah not much eh it's it's uh, it's funny because yeah at that age it's sort of like whatever is happening today is what we remember and we don't remind remember uh, much but i'm sure your um your contribution definitely sort of helped susan i know that uh, when she uh, she and i had a conversation we talked about it and and so forth so Thank God that we're not just focused on Susan's um, research or else, you know, the, the podcast interview would have been very short and sweet with you girls, <laughs> right? Um, okay, now you've lived 18 years with your mom and with your extended family. Um, this podcast is for um, child welfare professionals, but it's also for... Um, researchers and people who work in the field. Um, if you could do research in the field of parents and parenting with an intellectual disability or learning difficulties, what, what kind of questions would you ask or what kind of research would you want to do? Um, we'd probably do an interview with kids. Um, more like like asking them like who's important in their lives and why to kind of like what we kind of just um mentioned um yeah and like it could be like their friends cousins um grandparents like anyone really yeah and what would you want to know in asking them about their their families um just like if they want to maybe like move out of the situation they're in if they don't yeah um yeah how would they feel if they were removed in a situation yeah okay and couldn't see those people as often as they would have wanted to yeah yeah so maybe even like talk to kids who have been removed versus kids who haven't yeah, exactly. and try to see like the difference in terms of their networks. That would be sort of like really awesome, you know, to be able to see like, well, if you are removed, do, does it mean that your life is richer? Um, you know, because that would be sort of the point of, of having a new sort of life. Um, so that would be, I think, very interesting and I have a lot of hypotheses actually um, in terms of that. Now with Marg, um, because of you know um, her, her relationship with your mom and with you guys and because of me being sort of a bit like your mom I guess you know um, in my own situation where I also needed help from, from other people and, and that meant that Thomas needed help from other people. Um, so I often ask my mom, for example, and my dad was very involved as well. Um, so Marga and I often talk about co-parenting. So if I were to talk to you about co-parenting, what do you think? What do you think that means? And do you think that that's something that was used or or 
that could relate to your family and and your situation um, what i think it is is um having maybe two people um figuring mm -hmm. out um how to um help their ch um children or child um equally like have equal amount of time equal amount of effort into helping your, your, child. Child, your child stuff like that and it has played a key role in our lives um when we can't go to our mum we go to margaret and if um our mum needs space like growing up we would come to margaret's every weekend so our mum had space for herself and yeah have time to herself because of how often she was with us and helping us yeah no and and your mom is is a pretty great lady because I'm raising one child and sometimes I'm like oh my god this is like really hard work but for your mom she got two for the price of one right so uh raising twins is certainly sort of like double the work I'm sure um <laughs> and I'm just like thinking of like some of my friends who are twins. Um, did you ever play tricks on your mom when you were younger? Um, Not to our mom. Okay. But certainly to other people. <laughs> yeah, our mom kind of knew which one was which. So we she would really... sometimes mix us up, but... but most of the time she'd know which one's who. Yeah. And because she gave us that. set colors um, growing up of yeah. clothing. And you never like switch your clothing to try to. No. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the tricks that you would do to on other people? Do you want to share one? Well, um, in primary school, um, we had a canteen and um, yeah, we would both order at the same time because there was two lines. And um, once the lady who was um, getting our food we would switch spots okay. um, and yeah, and she would get confused. And sometimes when we didn't switch spots, um, she she would swap like, cause we had these little um, money cards things, yeah. like token thing. I yeah. Munch monitors, I think. Yeah, name. so there's like so money on it. Yeah, yeah, there's already money on it for you to use for food. And she would swap ours around when we didn't switch. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> that is fun. Yeah. And seriously, um, now that you're both like one beside the other, I can see the difference. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but if you weren't, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I knew. I would know. And obviously I didn't because I thought it was sort of Beth and Lily and the, the project. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you could play tricks on me. It would work probably. Um, okay. Now, if you could organize services like child welfare services or talk to, to people who manage their, those types of um, uh, programs, um, what would, would you want them to know or how would you organize services? And maybe that's two questions. So you could ask like, what kind of programs would you like or how would you organize the services? We'll start with that one. I think when they're considering taking the child away, they should have a talk with the child and ask them um, if they're comfortable with being removed from their family um, and providing like services for them as well as um, like for us, for example, um, our mom gets services for, for her disability so she can do things. And without her, her services, we, we wouldn't be able to um, have those services if she wasn't around. So maybe having something for the kids as well than just the person with the disability. Yeah. That is actually pretty smart. Um, <laughs> it is because you're right, right? Um, 
yeah, it makes me think actually of something I did after my accident where I had asked for Thomas to get services because I felt that my accident had not only affected me, but it also had affected him, even if he was very young. So you're basically sort of bringing up a similar situation where it's sort of like kids also need support, support. in different ways than the support that their parents might be getting. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah, that's pretty powerful too, in terms of, of that. So that's something that you would add, which I think is, is awesome. Now, to, if you were to talk to workers, so the people who are social workers um, or educators, in terms of how they act with parents with disabilities or with children and families, is there any like advice you would give them or any sort of um, things you would want them to know to be doing a better job with families? I think just in general, um, just try not to assume about like what the child wants, what the child wants or what the um, person with the disability wants. Just like ask them, I think, because they might like know what they want but they haven't had the chance to voice that yeah. So, yeah so what would you say if like someone would say okay well I'm gonna ask them what they want but I still feel that it's better let's say for them to be removed or it's better to do whatever I think my my recommendation is in terms of the service for example um is it really just about like what you want or is it also about what's what? better for you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, think that it's I better think... to remove? And I'm sorry, um, uh, Lily, I think you were saying something. Oh yeah, just um, providing choices if there was, like if it is a serious thing, providing choices and alternatives so they can still have what they want, but also to make it sure um, that they're living a better life and is safe for them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's what they want, but it's also, I guess, in a way what they need. Is that what yeah. I'm yeah. understanding? Yeah. And that's certainly like, if we're not asking, then we don't know. And um, we're making choices based on what we think is right when for them it might be different. When you don't have all the information. Yeah. And do you think you would have known, um, you know, at age five or six, what you wanted or what um, was important to you? Um, we definitely have different like ways of worrying about things than I think parents do. Um, for example, if the house is messy and all that, or like um, if there's a lot of stuff in one room or something, we, like us, for example, we um, didn't really worry about that because we just like knew it was just stuff that we needed and all that it didn't have to be too organized and stuff like that yeah yeah so, so you're Whereas, saying that um the pre preoccup uh, preoccupations are different in a perspective of a child than of a worker than of a parent yeah where yeah whereas um if like maybe a social worker or just like anyone walking in and they like see mess they constantly assume the worst yeah they constantly think that they aren't fit to parent because it's so messy and stuff like that but when it in that's reality, just, it's just how families are you have like messy houses sometimes and sometimes you don't you know it's just yeah yeah yeah, because that makes me think also of like, 
yeah, how we have sort of certain standards, I guess, or certain ways that we imagine should be, you know, a family should look like and how a family should work. Um, yeah. But then it's, it's learning about that family before even sort of passing judgment, you know, or sort of, um, and you said it earlier, you know, it's about asking the kids, it's about asking the parent. And that would be the case, you know, like if it's a parent from a different culture, right? Background, like you, we would ask or, or any type of parents, we, we would want to know or understand what they're going um, or what they value most. And you're yeah. right. I've seen that many times where we focused a lot about how the house is clean or not, or the cleanliness of it. Um, when there might be other things that are way much more important for the kids and for the parents and for different reasons. Um, but I really thank you because, you know, with a little bit of a conversation like this, like I've learned personally a lot of things and it's definitely made me realize that there's a whole lot more factors than sometimes we take for, for granted. And that definitely sort of listening to children is an important one. And mm -hmm. that sometimes children know what's good for them and what they would like for, for them to happen. And so for that, I think, thank you for, for being a voice um, for all the children, basically, who, who might have to either, you know, do research or, or talk to social workers and, um, and other workers that come in their house. And uh, thank you for taking the time. <laughs>